Um, welcome to Thinking on Sunday, uh, not at Conway Hall, just at Conway Hall, in quarantine still for uh, for, for a little while yet. Um, so good afternoon and I hope you're all doing well. Um, if you are unfamiliar with Conway Hall, we are a charity dedicated to ethical thought and humanism. Uh, we, we essentially exist. Hello, Vancouver, Canada. We, we exist to... Um, promote uh, ethical and humanist thought. Um, and we do that by, in a number of ways, including our regular Sunday afternoon talks, which we're doing now from my ship in South East London and various other places. Um, really excited about uh, this afternoon's event. Um, I've been running Thinking on Sunday now for coming up to three years, I think. And one thing we really wanted to do was to um, bring people who are actually out in the world doing things and making the world a better place to, to other people's attention. And I sincerely hope that's what we're doing today. Uh, so to see how things are gonna go, um, I will hand over to our panel of at the moment, two people, hopefully three people as the event goes on. Um, they will speak for around half an hour, 45 minutes or so, um, and then they will take questions. How we will do questions is um, if you put a question into the Q and A bubble on in Zoom, you can see it at the bottom. Hopefully, you can see it at the bottom of your screen. Um, type in your question, and then we will offer to open your microphone so you can ask your question live. If you don't wish us to open your microphone, just say please read out question, no mic, and we will read out read out your question. And in a way, we can have a dialogue with the people that we've got speaking for us today. Um, so the theme for today is pandemic solidarity, essentially how people during the COVID crisis um, didn't look to institutions because often they weren't concerned with people and looked to each other to help get through the ongoing crisis. And with that, we have, currently we have Marina Citrin, who is a assistant professor at SUNY Bingham, to, oh no, I can't read that, Binghamton University and Ariella Patchen, student, activist, artist, and a lot more. And we hope to be joined shortly by Yusuf Alp of the Besquitas Solidarity Network. Um, so they're gonna bring their cameras online now. Uh, do please welcome them to this virtual event. Thank you. I'm Marina Citrin. I teach at Binghamton University, um, which is in upstate New York in the US. And it's not where I am right now, but... Um, and I've been involved in movements since and groups um, and kind of looking towards justice since I was quite young um, and now try to do that, but also um, I'm a mother and my child is about to come in that right now. Honey. Um, I have to. Um, and yeah, sorry about this. Um, and hi. one of the many things I've hi. been doing is you want to say hi, honey? We're talking hi. to a bunch of people. Um, this is what Hello, we, we welcome children and cats at our events, don't uh, worry, and dogs. This does not show, show, show uh, there. There. Okay, um, sorry about that. This, I'm sure, is what so many of us are experiencing. So I'm not actually sorry about that. Um, that is what it means, actually, to try and function. And especially as a single mom, um, this is what we got. Anyway, so what I was going to say is in addition to engaging in movements, I personally try to write about them as much as I can through facilitating people's voices in those movements. And so this latest project is actually my being a part of editing a book where a whole bunch of people from all over the world who are both kind of in movements and writing about movements um, did this as well. So this beautiful book, Pandemic Solidarity, uh, Mutual Aid in COVID-19 crisis, during COVID-19 crisis. And I co-edited it, which I'll talk about um, in a few minutes when I talk about kind of the process of our doing it. Um, and we did it very quickly. So starting in March, when it became more apparent to a lot of people um, kind of in the parts of Europe and, and the US anyway, even though in other parts of the world, obviously COVID had been raging. Um, we started to talk about it in actually a class. I was teaching on ethnography. And in that graduate class, people from different parts of the world were talking about how 
um, what they were being told about what was happening was so different than the reality. And that began this process. It was actually Shema from Turkey um, who, who began reflecting in that way. And a number of us thought, well, maybe we could do some kind of project. And from there, spun um, what eventually became a book, which was published in June. So a very quick project. And the process is important because, so I'm gonna describe it a little bit. And it's important because I think it both reflects what this moment is, kind of how, especially in times of crisis, people take care of one another. And so that care base, um, and that this care and mutual aid solidarity, which we can talk about in the discussion, kind of what does that mean, um, is taking place everywhere. So you don't have to kind of look, and this is what we found with the book and say, okay, where are the hot spots for acts of solidarity and care? Um, what happened was there was a handful of us in the class from different parts of the world, Ariella is one of them, um, and say, for example, Devarati, who's from India. And she then said, oh, well, I have a friend, Midya, who is in, who's Kurdish in Kurdish Northern Iraq. Okay, so we just assumed, of course, there would be mutual aid and solidarity happening there. Of course, it'd be happening in India. Of course, it's in Northern Iraq. She reached out to a friend who's from Taiwan. Um, I reached out to a friend of mine who was a part of Occupy Wall Street in New York City, who's from Brazil, and she's in Brazil now, Vanessa, who did the chapter on Brazil incredible networks taking place um, throughout Brazil. She then contacted a friend, Laís, who's from Brazil, but living in Portugal, um, who co-edited the chapter on Portugal with Raquel, um, who then reached out to her friend, Boa Ventura in Southern Africa. So it's kind of this friendship network of people who are engaged in different ways in social justice, social movements, thinking about them anyway, if not fully engaged in them. Some people housed in universities as far as background, a lot of people not, but equally scholars. Um, a friend, someone who I knew in Argentina, for example, Nancy, back from the Popular Rebellion in 2002. And this is significant also because, you know, if you think about what happened with the Occupy movements around the world, or what happened in Argentina in 2002, it was a popular rebellion um, because of an economic crisis, but where people came together in this horizontal way, creating assemblies to take care of one another. So these various kinds of experiences that have happened throughout time um, and the experiences that are happening now. And so this is what's covered in the book and each chapter is edited or co-edited um, with people from around the world. So we have some of the chapters I named, actually Sabu, someone who I know from Japan, again, from kind of global justice movements from many years ago, put me in touch with um, Jiung, who's from South Korea, who edited a chapter. So the, the book spans regions all over the world without our having made this plan that where are the best places. It's all of these people agreed to interview people um, in different areas to talk about um, what's happening. How are people taking care of one another? And doing so in a way that is, and as will be described a bit, um, kind of neighborhood to neighborhood. And that's this idea in solidarity and in mutual aid, it's our taking care of each other and one another. And it's a process of mutuality. So it's not, let's get a big agency to get some money and give it to us. I mean, that would be nice, but we're also in so many parts of the world that doesn't actually even happen if we wanted it to. Um, so it's both these institutions fail because they don't actually support us or not sufficiently. Um, and we actually can do it better. Not that we have more material resources, but we know one another more. We're able to check in with one another more. So what does your neighbor need? You would know better than probably some federal or regional agency. So there's that sense of this mutuality. And then as people reflect in the different chapters, when you know, you're engaged in this or people are helping you in a certain way, there's a dynamic and we kind of change in that process. So that mutuality is also in the aiding isn't just um, a packet of food or making sure you have your health care, though that has been vital for people, especially elderly and people who are more vulnerable, but that we see one another, we hear one another, we recognize each other and that our lives are intertwined with kind of the other, right? Um, and that other becomes less other. And it's this mutual, beautiful relationship. Now, and I'm not, also none of us are trying to say it's all this beautiful relationship and we were talking about a horrible, 
horrible pandemic. So it's not that we tell these pretty stories and act as if all this horrible stuff is not happening. Um, a lot of people link this horrible, the pandemic and the kind of crisis to also systemic crises. So that um, so many people are hit worse than others. For example, in what is the United States? We, we use the language of Turtle Island for the chapter in, um, and Ariella will talk about this a little bit or she'll talk about the Turtle Island chapter. Um, but here, the people who are dying the most of COVID are disproportionately people of color. The only children who have died from COVID, and there are children, are of African descent, right? So there's like, we, we're not saying this doesn't, all of this horrible stuff doesn't exist, like the, the structural inequality. It's how do we take care of one another to, to help in that process and shift it. And in the process of creating these relationships, people are questioning more and more why things are happening the way they're happening. So it's about helping one another now and questioning and thinking differently. How can we organize things differently? Per not just perhaps, but kind of urgently <laughs> that we have to. And so for example, in the chapter on Greece, um, they discuss abolition, which Ariel is going to. Some people who are interviewed are talking about how people are organizing in the jails, but also healthcare. There's solidarity clinics there, which came out of a different crisis, an economic crisis in Greece, but where people started to organize their healthcare autonomously. So doctors in the community creating health clinics that aren't actually through the state, mainly because of the failure of the state, but also then in the process of doing that, they're rethinking, well, what does health mean? Is health just our bodies? Is it our mind and our bodies? Is it our community? Who makes decisions over healthcare? So all of these bigger questions come up and that comes up in this process of mutuality and solidarity. So that, um, to give a little sprinkling, there's so many other things and we can talk about it maybe more in the discussion. I have so many issues I wanted to make sure to talk about that are covered in the chapter, but I think actually I'm gonna pause now um, and share space and then if there are comments or questions, we can talk about maybe more of the thematics that come up and what does this look like? Crisis in general, this happens in crisis, you know, that both institutions fail. There's a whole area of sociology on sociology of organizations and how these hierarchical organizations fail us. And actually people on the ground in more kind of horizontal ways, meaning more direct with one another without the, the hierarchy and the power over each other um, are much more efficient even. Um, as well as caring and loving. Oh, and then the part I did want to say, sorry, last last bit, but it's so important about the process, which is in doing this book, we would have weekly Zooms, all of us as a group. So there's, is it 18 or 21? Are you allowed to, is it 18? 18, 21, 21 people. I guess it's 18 or 19 are women. So we're almost all women. A lot of us mothers, some of us single mothers. Um, from all over the world and we would meet early in the morning US time to, you know, because there's also people in, you know, 12 hours away in, in Asia and, um, and Middle East. So we would have these Zooms and talk about the book and the vision. And we created this relationship with one another that Nancy from Argentina at one point referred to as, you know, a life vest that we were buoying each other up. And it really was like in this horrible, scary, overwhelming moment, the process of doing this book and the relationships that we created with one another in doing it was so buoying. It lifted us and held each of us differently, but kind of held us in a kind of inspiration and in a hope and a care um, at a time that was so scary. And that in so many ways, our process without intending it prefigured kind of manifest the kind of relationship we might want what was also happening in so many of these mutual aid um, networks and these solidarity networks around the world and so that it still is a relationship when we see each other even through a computer it's like faces beam it's there's this real love that happens in this space and that's a part of the political process um, that maybe we could also talk about okay so I'm going to mute now and um, pass it to Ariella. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Ariella. I'm a graduate student at Binghamton. Um, but yeah, some reflections about what Marina just said. It really was such a beautiful process to be a part of uh, because, I mean, I think all of us being overwhelmed with this pandemic and all these narratives of fear and crisis. I mean, thinking about when there was no toilet papers on the shelves, it was just like, oh, no, like what what else can we have? What else can we imagine? So it really was just like this amazing process to be a part of. And like Marina said, just so much love to people who were just genuinely caring for one another and just checking in constantly. And a part of those meetings were the check-in process, like, hi, how are you doing? Please tell me, um, because it is like a time of being in our own world, in our own solitude, in the confines of our apartments. Uh, so it really was an amazing process. but. Uh, just giving some background of where I am. So I'm in Binghamton and uh, Broome County, the county that I'm a part of, has the largest uh, rate of incarceration in, I think, New York and maybe within the United States. I don't know. Um, so there was, so there already has been a lot of activism and the calls for prison abolition here. Uh, but the book chapter Turtle Island, it starts with um, Turtle Island as being a part of like uh, indigenous First Nation folklore of what Mother Earth is. And as we're, you know, on occupied land, making sure that we're giving, um, you know, respect to what uh, people from the First Nations, that it's making sure that you know, giving recognition for that. Um, so my part of the chapter dealt with prison abolition and uh, what was going on in terms of making sure that incarcerated people not only knew what was going on um, on the outside world, because a lot of that information was being blocked and prevented. And even if it was coming in, it was uh, being kind of watered down, saying that this wasn't such a big deal. And as people on the inside tell, tell my the people that I um, interviewed, um, people were getting sick, but they had no idea what it was. People were being quarantined and put into solitary confinement. So it was this really horrible thing that was going on. Uh, so the people that I interviewed were part of the Metropolitan Anarchist Coordinating Council, the Michigan Abolition and Prisoner Solidarity Network, and the Columbus Freedom Coalition. So these organizers were across um, the United States, uh, mostly just doing a lot of legal work and making sure that there was support for people inside, that they knew what was going on, and that they were also getting proper not only medical care but cleaning supplies um there was a lot of really quick turnaround for these organizers um, and making sure that uh people on the inside were not only getting those materials but also knowing that people on the outside were looking out for them so a lot of call-in campaigns uh to local um, government um, a lot of drive-bys uh, because people couldn't actually organize rallies because of these really strict social distancing protocols. People had signs on their car and they were honking and um, people um, on the inside were able to just wave and just like know that people were there. So that was a really huge important part of it. Um, and there was also this really big moment for organizers in thinking about the current conditions that we're living in, right? So one of the, the organizers, Alejo Stark, likened it to like a house with with cracks, which is a, a Zapatista metaphor. And uh, thinking about there are cracks in the walls and we're still in this house and we just slowly need to puncture it, but they're still we're still in the house. So finding ways that people can imagine how to come together and, you know, push for an abolitionist agenda, uh, which is an interesting moment right now because we're seeing these calls to free them all. And um, people are realizing that you know, being incarcerated during the pandemic is not only really scary, but life-threatening. And there's a push to have people on the inside being released. So people are starting to take up this abolitionist imaginary that wasn't really there. And one of the organizers that I spoke to from the Columbus Freedom Coalition uh, talked about how this idea of like radical care and radical organizing isn't so radical in these moments uh, because it's actually what people need and people are coming out of their, you know, this isolated neoliberal bubble to making making sure that people are checking in on each other 
Um, but like a lot of these activists are saying, mutual aid is, is a word to describe this, but it was happening prior to COVID and it will continue happening long after COVID. So it's, it's a word that has a lot of value in this time, but also can be thought of and critiqued because this stuff was already there. People already cared about each other for so long and making sure um, that uh, needs were being met, not only for incarcerated people, but as you see throughout the book, which is so amazing, just to see how all these networks are just genuinely checking in on each other, making sure that people have access to ho household items, food, uh, hygiene products, um, which is also happening. Um, and Marina talked about what's going on in Greece. And there's a solidarity fund there for imprisoned and persecuted militants. So prior to COVID, they were not only covering court expenses and bail money, um, but they're also now trying to support people by, you know, giving them access to hygiene products, access to food, like making sure there's a regular check-in with people, um, which is a beautiful thing. And it's something that's that isn't new, but it is becoming more pressing now that there is this, this huge um, moment of being in isolation, being in quarantine. Um, and that's also something that is not new to the United States. Um, in Argentina, Nancy um, and Liz talk about this with um, Yono Fui, which is um, another mutual aid network. And they're mostly providing mutual aid for formerly incarcerated women. So like, like the United States, like Greece, those feminine hygiene products, the food, but um, they write that um, a major part of this moment is, is listening. And there's this quote, listening becomes a fundamental space. So it, it's offering people the chance to talk about their fears, their anxieties, things that they might not have recognized before. So it's it's this beautiful moment of of being in this 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 house that has cracks, like Alejo says. But we're there together, and we're going to build it if it falls, and and we're going to puncture through those cracks and and really think about what is going on and how we can rebuild something better. Yes, Ariella, I think we're waiting for Yusuf, who I'm not sure if it's a technical problem or what's happened that he's not here at this moment. I don't know if folks know that there was an earthquake both in um, Turkey and in you know, parts of Greece recently. Probably you do because you're closer to it geographically. Um, and I know that that was affecting a lot of people's connectivity, but I don't know what's happening. I mean, I wonder if maybe we should um, move, have a few, questions and then when Yusuf comes, if he's able to come, um, kind of bring that into the discussion and just have a longer intervention. Yeah, um, I, hope, I hope we can do that. Um, sorry, yeah, I, I, obviously I, I wasn't sure whether the earthquakes had affected Yusuf or not. Um, hopefully he is okay. Um, it's really interesting talking about, I'm just going to close the door because there's a police helicopter about me, hang on. It's really interesting hearing about. I mean, the early the early days of the pandemic were only like March and April, and it's interesting hearing you talk because it's. I think it's more present in your minds because you have been writing about it. Um, I'm just going to share this because I think you know, you're a captive audience for a second. But I've got this, which is a box of risotto rice that I got from a, a supermarket near where I live, and it was just after the time when there was no food anywhere. Uh, you know, all the shops were empty. There was no food at all. And I've got two young children, both of whom are, are autistic, and they really struggled when they're hungry, and I was really, really worried. And then I went to my local Sainsbury's one day, and they got lots of food. They'd obviously got from different suppliers. This is an atypical box of risotto rice. And I, I just finished it the other day, and because it's just a, a, a sign of the time that we were in, that, you know, I was really afraid that I couldn't feed my family, I can't throw the box away. It's really weird. That's now my box friend. And while I've been talking, I wonder if any of our any any of our uh, audience are, have any questions, or if any of the panelists have any questions for us as well. If you do want to type uh, your question in, if you just put your hand up or put something in the chat, um, and we will see how we go. Um, 
I'm going to yam up for a bit more. <laughs> well, one thing I was interested in, Ariella and Marina, is, um, I mean, Marina mentioned uh, being part of a, an anarchist network. You know, did you find any um, sort of, what would be the right word? What were the common threads of sort of philosophy and, and uh, beliefs and sort of political identities that joined you if there were some? And were there any sort of disparate things within the people working on the network? I'm, I'm quite interested in that. It's a really important point. And there were, you know, Ariella discussed, there was one of the prison groups was an anarchist network um, yeah, based yeah. here in the US and then one in Greece. Um, and I think there was a relationship to one in Portland, but actually for the most part, the networks were a huge mix. And that's part of what um, I think is both so strong and exciting about this part of what's happening in this moment, which is, some people had prior organizing experiences, sometimes, depending where we are, I mean, we could maybe just go specifically to different regions of the world. Um, and sometimes not at all, that it was, you know, in a lot of places, teachers played a huge role mm. in facilitating a lot of the distribution because they have special knowledge of families and locations and needs. And so a lot of distribution all around, not just the US, but in different parts of the world happened from schools. So in Argentina, for example, there's teachers who are organized or Portland, um, Oregon and the United States or the far west coast of the north. Um, it's, you know, through the schools. Sometimes they weren't supposed to do certain things as far as what they were distributing um, and they did anyway, or, you know, so people also in formal roles stretching their position to be able to help people. But as far mm -hmm. as background, it really was all over the place. I mean, the Southern Africa, chapter. Boa Ventura writes about some of the people he interviewed who said that um, there were some pre-existing political groups and networks, not anarchist, um, kind of community-based networks, but because of the history, they had different political and ideological backgrounds. And for the first time, they were actually working with one another across mm. the entire region, kind of crossing borders as well. So that I think we're seeing more as well that it's kind of breaking some of that ideological difference because people hear mutual aid and oh, it was coined by Kropotkin, you know, it's an anarchist. Mm. So maybe this is an anarchist phenomenon. And um, I don't think it is. It's, I mean, anarchists claim it um, as kind of theirs when people take care of each other, but I think that's actually wrong. I think people just take, we, you know, your neighbor needs something, you check in. If, if anyone should be anarchist. worried about having their ideas appropriated, it's probably anarchists. <laughs> so, but it, but it's a mix. I mean, it's so it's a real mix that we're seeing everywhere. I think the bigger question is a re not the bigger question, but a question is about you know how does it continue because it's such a mix of people from different backgrounds. Yeah. Um, that's that's one thing. Um, and then another, there is though, and we could talk about it if people have more questions about this. It is interesting that people in different places I have found who've been involved were involved in similar kinds of comings together in moments of crisis, whether that was Nancy yeah. in Argentina or some of the initial people in Istanbul in Turkey um, were part of the Getsi moments of the, you know, the movements of the squares. And so there's, there are threads throughout as Ariella was talking about as well. It's not kind of new, this relationship mm -hmm. yeah. is so massive. Um, yeah, and just a, another thing is not only in, in organizing there being this long, um, history of these threads but in this idea of like what can happen next and this potential for the imaginary to really come through mm. these communities can sustain themselves and have sustained themselves and you know some of them will not work out but there's always going to be that base which will continue forward um regardless of like this political ideology um I think, I mean, I think that's certainly true. Because obviously I've, I've not really had the time or energy to be involved in in, in the local uh, um, mutual aid networks. My local one mainly seems to be, up, be about baking, to be honest, um, rather than anything else. It was a big spate of baking that happened in the UK once the uh, lockdown first came down. But I know ones nearby in places like New Cross have, have been more along the sort of the, the mutual aid lines sort of thing. Um, I think it's quite interesting what you said about teachers helping out because I've got friends who teachers who before the pandemic were spending their own money on uh, things to help the, the most vulnerable students in their class and that's 
certainly something that teachers have been filling the gap for. And also in the UK, we, we have we've had food banks, and we've had uh, also when pe people are striking, often more people you know, get spontaneous people supporting the families of people striking, which is all brilliant stuff. And and, and again, I, I, my, my my concern about that, and all of this is brilliant, but my one concern is that. Um, I think in the UK, at least, our, we've currently got quite a right-wing government, I think, and they're very much of the people should be able to pay, pay less, less tax and be able to look after themselves with the money, which is not a philosophy that I think really works. And so the idea that people organising themselves sort of makes government and establishments think that they're off the hook a little bit. Um, how, I, I don't think that. I'm just kind of thinking what you think of that possible idea. Anyone? For sure. I think we lost you there. Are you, are you there, Marina? Okay. This. Okay. Is that working? We can hear you now. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, we're supposed to have gale winds where I am soon, so hopefully not. Okay. Now. okay. Um, I've currently got helicopters. Okay. So, you've got a helicopter. Okay. Um, the intimacy of this moment to kind of zooming into each other's houses. Mm. Um, so, you know, I think that is something people say for sure. Um, and that I think though assumes the government would want to help us. And I, maybe it depends where you are in the world. I mean, obviously in the UK and in the US right now, I don't think anybody would think that's really true as far as like helping people to survive and meet our needs. Um, it's much more of the, you work hard and you support yourself or else, you know, kind of too bad. Um, and, you know, governments want to be seen as legitimate in the eyes of populations. So I don't think they would either say, you know, oh, we're off the hook, yeah. we're not gonna. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it works kind of in either direction um, as far as, yeah, I don't know if Ariella wants to talk about this as well, but I mean, I mean, it's around the world too, they haven't, you know, like people have said this, um, like for example, when people take over workplaces, um, which happened in Argentina in massive numbers, you know, not just making cooperatives, but kind of running them without hierarchy, without bosses, mm -hmm. and kind of creating a whole different kind of value. Um, and that's a discussion in a few places now, which I think would be a really interesting conversation as well, kind of how we kind of up this, um, um, what's going on. It doesn't, you know, does it take a government, is the government off the hook because workers are now taking over bankrupt workplaces and putting them back into production? No, I mean, I don't think it, I mean, we can still make demands on the government and at yeah. the same time create this alternative. I did notice there was a, com a question in the chat. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, I, I, uh, Gavin Seeley, I saw your comment in the chat as well. Um, I'm currently not a host, so I can't open your microphone. So, um, have a look. Um, Harriet, are you there? Could you open Gavin Seeley's microphone? Hello. Hi, Gavin. Yeah, uh, it's a really interesting conversation. I'm from uh, the borough of Newham in London, and there's a great deal happening here. Uh, in terms of mutual aid. Uh, one of the things that I would like to um, see happening is a link up between local groups and uh, groups across the world. Uh, and I just wanted to know if um, Marina or anyone else had, um, had that uh, on their uh, ongoing agenda. I mean, how can we link into what uh, is happening elsewhere? Some places that Marina has mentioned, Greece, Argentina, etc., uh, etc. Et um, it would be uh, fantastic if this became not just um, something local, which is valuable, but also something international that uh, can really start to be transformative. That's it. Um, 
I think I think right now, well, we, initially we we're trying to to make a website um, to kind of make sure that there was always this link to the book that was ongoing and and just alive where people can find the, those those networks that are available. But yeah, um, it is a question of how we can not only focus on the local and, and but also connect to one another. Um, and I think it, as weird as Zoom is and all this like new media that's coming up, it gives us the potential to reach out to one another and check in. Um, but yeah, I don't know, Marina, if you wanted to say more. I don't, I'm not sure if Marie. Thank you, Gavin. I mean, that's actually what all of the different contributors, like the different people who are interviewed in different places around the world, that's kind of what they asked. Like, okay, this is great. You know, yes, sharing our stories is really important and it can be helpful to reflect on what you're doing to share your story. And how do we meet other people who are doing this similarly? Um, which it's too bad Yosef can't be on now there will be other events with people from Turkey because they started in Istanbul and people were organizing in different cities, but they now have networks. So they've made a network of networks, similar to what happened in Southern Africa, not just South Africa, but the whole region. Um, and that I agree is tremendous. And that's what all the contributors would want. And we're hoping, you know, slowly it's contributors in, who've, in the book in those regions to one another. Um, but ideally we would also do that, of course globally. Language is a bit of an issue and it's actually something we discuss in the introduction because we did the book in English and actually the majority language was I think first Kurdish and Portuguese and then Spanish and then you know it was not only a handful of people spoke English as their first language doing it so being cognizant of all of that and trying to figure out how to meet one another because if we're you know, I think we all agree we're going to see more crises. Um, and in crisis, it's people who take care of each other, not, you know, on occasion, governments do, depending where you live, but it's not the norm. The norm is people need to take care of each other. And um, the more we can strengthen these networks, totally, the better. There was one thing I just wanted to, to say, because we're talking about kind of mutual aid networks. And I think for people who maybe are participating here who are like Scott in your neighborhood, there isn't one in that immediate region in the same way. I think we can also think differently or we should think differently about what we mean by this. So it can mean these formal networks where people have phone lists and email lists or however, you know, and are coordinating daily. But then there's also the act of really just, did you check in with your neighbor? Did they check in with you? I mean, my neighbors and I on either side started to say, you know, kind of communicate about a lot of these things, making sure we have what we need. And then it became this like, I see you thing. Um, just kind of like we recognize each other, seeing each other, like even these acts that we do are really significant in this moment. And so not letting that go um, as far as, okay, mutual aid is only if it's organized in this big scale or whatever, that the caring for each other and the checking in with each other can happen on whatever level. And then maybe it's a few neighbors and we make that a little more organized. And we say, well, let's make sure we check on the next block or, you know, the next, there's a video and I can share it. We can share it later on that they put together in Turkey that has English subtitles. It's about 15 minutes. And it beautifully goes through just kind of like the day to day, what it's like when they're organizing their network, how they did it, the flyers they put up that had you know, telephone numbers, not email, because a lot of older people are not using the internet so much. So just telephone or putting things in mailboxes, depending where you live, as a way of beginning to check. And a handful of people can begin to do that. You, know, you and two friends um, at an appropriate distance and everything else can kind of begin that process. And that's really just how a mutual aid network starts. It does, it's not some big theoretical complicated thing. It's, did you check on Jane and Juan? Um, oh no, let's, let's make sure that we do, you know, and then we kind of coordinate that checking in and then see what needs are, and then it can kind of scale up and over. So, um, yeah, let's see if we have any more questions. We, uh, we don't have any more questions at the moment. So, uh, Marini, Marini, you said there's a film that you could possibly share, which does sound really interesting. 
Okay, looks like we're going to get um, a quick film screening of about 15 minutes. Maybe. Maybe not. that I was on two nights ago. Am I able to, I don't have the link. It's on YouTube. I haven't looked, I don't have the actual link. So I had thought Yusuf might have it. Um, I don't know how to go into like archives of a past conversation. Okay. Yeah, we'll <laughs> Sorry. But I think there's some more comments. Maybe we can see if there's more discussion. And then let's have a look. Yeah, I think, who was that? So, oh, sorry, Beth, we're going to open up your microphone if you're there and we can, you can speak to the panel. Um, okay. Hello. Um, Hello. Thank you for joining I, us. I wanted to join this talk because I don't know much about mutual aid and I've just done a Google and actually seen there are a couple of mutual aid organisations in Hertfordshire where I'm based. But the issue is a lot of the time when you're a disabled person, you're having to fight for safety needs. And if you don't already have a pre-existing community checking in on you and ensuring that, you know, you're OK, especially if in the UK, there was a whole shielding thing where effectively disabled people were just left to fend for themselves. Um, it's very hard to not feel like I'm doing it wrong because I don't have a network of people or I don't know how to connect with people because I'm just struggling day to day with dealing with bureaucracy for those safety needs. So, um, and also I'm holding a lot of grief at the moment that intersectionality doesn't seem to account for disability a lot of the time. So I just kind of wanted to know... Um, well, some reassurance that people are thinking about the hidden obstacles to do with being a disabled person in a crisis and also just any pointers or advice, I suppose. Already such a hard time for people, especially if you're living alone. And so having whatever disability is a term that's used, but it, it makes it so much harder. So first, I think definitely looking and seeing if there are networks around you and reaching out directly to people. I mean, this is the time when, from not just kind of my experience as Marina, but from the contributors from all over the world, what people were finding is it's the time when people are opening in a different way and just saying, what can I do? Or this is what I need. Can you help meet this need? And, and in the idea of mutual aid, it's not like asking someone to give you something. It's seeing that we're all connected, right? We have to be all connected in this world. And so that we want to help one another and kind of going in with that assumption. Um, but the particular needs and challenges, the, the chapter on South Korea in the book, and if you want, you can, I mean, we can see if people could email. We have a website called pandemicsolidarity.net. And if you go there and you want to send an email or email me directly or Ariella, we can, we can make sure to get you a copy of the book because the chapter on South Korea is especially inspiring, I think, because it's focused only on disability rights groups. And it highlights what I think a lot of people don't know, which is what does it mean if you're already kind of held in a, in a house and you have mobility challenges, for example, and then you're the person who's supposed to come you know, by the government or whomever um, is supposed to come and check on you and then they can't or they won't. And people were finding in South Korea anyway, like throughout South Korea, the Jiyong traveled around the country and spoke to people that people were just being left. Um, and so people organized, they actually organized in a movement sense that's more traditional that we're not seeing as much in the pandemic. Well, it is with the movement for black lives that in certain places we are but like going out in the street and saying, we demand this, um, you need to see us um, and organizing in that way, but it's um, incredibly difficult. Um, and I think, I mean, my suggestion as far as who to ask and 
how to reach out if there are those specific networks near you or even like not that close to where you are, but kind of finding them and just saying, hey, is there someone I can speak to? And trying to get someone you could actually even just talk to on a telephone from one of the networks. Um, Cause that's what so many of us are doing too. We're kind of at home trying to reach out. Some people can't, you know, I'm a terrible cook. Like I would never cook for people unless we were kind of desperate. I mean, I cook for my child, but it's like pasta and you know, it's pretty easy, but I could talk. I can, you know, talk to people on the telephone. So there are a lot of people in the networks. It's not just about food and making food or getting medical supplies. It's also about having conversations, helping people negotiate bureaucracies, especially in places where governments might actually give something to people in this time, um, figuring out how to get it uh, because it's our right to have these things. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think definitely trying to find that community and, and making sure that there's, even if there's distance, there's distance is, it means a whole other thing in this moment where it just like we can connect with each other on Zoom. But yeah, there are a lot of, um, there's a lack of consideration and a lot of movements around disability. And then, like you said, there is this idea of intersectionality and where does disability fill in, fit into there? Um, but there are movements who, um, and networks that are like focusing on, I, I know for here, there's there's a food delivery service. So people who not only um, have disabilities, but also just can't leave their house because of other kinds of co being compromised. There's those delivery services to make sure they're still getting access to this type of food. So it's just like this, it's not about uh, finding a specific m movement or, or network. It's just having those, just starting to, reach out and make those connections um, and like there's just so much love and there wants to go around and this is just want to to just kind of check in with one another yeah sorry I didn't say that so eloquently you did okay um if anyone else has a question or comment do please put your hand up or the like. Um, what we'll do also is we'll find out what the video is on YouTube and we will send it out to anyone who is interested. If you contact us at uh, scott at conwayhall.org.uk um, if you've got any queries on this as well, but because I'd be very keen to see the video. We hope Yusuf is doing well. Um, so I, I just wanted to finish. First of all, thank you, Ariella and Marina. It's really interesting and inspiring as ever. Um, so, yeah. so the other one, the, what I mainly like about the idea of mutual aid networks, ones that don't only distribute sourdough bread to the neighbours, is uh, we, the, the idea that we are um, sort of building a better world beneath the existing one. Um, do you think that's what we are attempting to do? I think it's not building a world underneath, it's... Um... For me, like there's this quote by the Zapatistas that talk about a world within new worlds. So you're having this idea of there, we're existing in this world and we're recognizing that there are failures and people are suffering because of it. But we're building things that it's within this structure. Like I said before, we're in this house, we're in it together, but we're slowly puncturing through the cracks. So it, it's a moment from below for sure, but it, it's it's more on this horizontal level where people are just radically caring for each other and, and imagining what else is possible. Not only without a world without prisons, a world without borders, but a world in which, you know, we're not staying in this in this isolated realm. Um, so yeah, I think I think there's this uh, this possibility in the, these pockets of networks and resistance that kind of form during this moment. And like I said before, they they stay or and they were here before. So it's not just a just yeah, not just from below, but it's above. Yeah. It's showing what else is able to happen. I think. Brilliant, thank you. Um, uh, Kirstine has just shared the NHS responders volunteers number for anyone who wants to take a look at that in the chat. Um, if that's it for everyone, I uh, just want to say thank you to Marina and Ariella, and we hope Yusuf is okay over in Turkey. Thank you for a good afternoon. That was, um, like I said, it's, it's, it's inspiring and fascinating stuff. Um, and thank you everyone for coming along. Uh, this, 
this will be up on YouTube um, at some point in the future once we've uh, edited out the bits of I fluff. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks for everyone for coming along. And uh, I think we've got two more thinking on Sundays for this year, and it'll be good to see people there. And uh, Ariella and Marina, do, do please keep in touch with us. Uh, the, your researches are the sort of things that we're very interested in, and we'd like to hear more from you in the future. So thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning to those of you who it's still morning. And uh, thank you for everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye bye.